Good evening and welcome to E-Bible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 35 of Revelation chapter 2. And we're continuing to look at verses 26 and 27. And it says there, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And we've um, seen a verse 27 statement that he will rule them with a rod of iron is referring to the Lord Jesus. And it has particular emphasis upon judgment day itself as Revelation 19 and Psalm 2 use very similar language to describe the judgment of Christ upon the unsaved people of the world. And it is then we know that uh, God will take the vessels, as he um, speaks of mankind, that were created but made in a dishonorable way due to their sin, and destroy them. That's when he'll uh, break them to shivers, as our verse in Revelation 2.27 indicates. And we've been looking at uh, the language of Christ ruling the nations. It, it says in Revelation 19.15, he will uh, smite the nations with the sword from his mouth, and that would be the word of God. And, and by the way, that's a spiritual reference when it says that Christ will smite the nations that were to slay the nations. Uh, it, it's done with the word of God. And that's exactly what we have learned since entering into the day of judgment, this period of time, this present time we're living in, that God is judging the world he, he is killing them by uh, his word. He, it's not literal um, destruction that's, that's occurring. The world isn't being smitten to pieces literally. But in a spiritual sense, God has done this. And uh, also, uh, he has put down Satan, as we've been seeing in several verses, and the Lord Jesus Christ has been exalted. God uses that figure in the book of Jeremiah and Ezra when um, Babylon falls, also in the book of Daniel, Babylon falls, and Cyrus, the king of the Medes and the Persians, takes the kingdom. He, he is the one who conquers Babylon. And, and uh, Cyrus is typifying the Lord Jesus as Isaiah 45 verse 1 clearly shows us. Also in another historical parable in the book of Esther, the Lord pictures judgment day as the day that Haman is killed. And it so happens that in the historical setting, he was killed on the 17th day of the second month. And, and of course that date um, relates to May 21 of 2011, as May 21 had the 17th day of the second Hebrew month underlying that date. It was, it was the 17th day of the second month in the Hebrew calendar. And that day ties in with the day of the flood and the day that God shut the door of the ark. And in the book of Esther, Haman was killed and Mordecai, a great type of Christ, was lifted up to take over the house of Haman. Now, these are passages we've learned because the 70-year period of Babylonian captivity, God uses to typify the Great Tribulation. And the end of the 70 years would picture the end of the Great Tribulation, which, again, uh, happened to occur on May 21 after an exact 23-year period of great tribulation. And, and, and immediately after the tribulation comes Judgment Day. And these are things that we've been learning. Well, now we find 
that there is a system of eschatology called premillennialism in which they also have noted several scriptures in which they they realize that the Bible teaches the Lord Jesus will reign on the earth in time. Now, uh, of course, their system, their theological system has many errors, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. They, they take the Bible literally in many places they shouldn't, and it leads them way off course. They, they end up far from truth again and again due to their failure to understand how God wrote the Bible, that he, he spoke in parables, and without a parable he did not speak. And we must look for the spiritual meaning um, in, in the Scripture. And when the Lord speaks of David reigning in Jerusalem, uh, he's not referring to King David of old, that he'll be resurrected, but he's referring to Christ, pictured by David. And when the Lord speaks of a great plan for the Jews in the future, he's not referring to national Israel and the physical descendants of Abraham, but the spiritual Jews, those that are saved by God from every nation, Jew and Gentile, the Israel of God, circumcised in heart. They're the Jews that the Bible has in, in focus, not, not the Jews of Israel over in the Middle East. And, and when the Bible speaks of a thousand-year reign, it, it's not a literal thousand-year period, but God is using the number thousand as he often uses the number 10 or 100 or 1,000 in the Bible to point to the completeness of whatever is in view. In this case, the reign of Christ with his people. And so you can see how uh, quickly they get off course and, and, and uh, go off the, the proper pathway that God has established in his word. So please don't, uh, don't think that... Uh, e-bible is recommending premillennialism at all we're not it it will certainly lead astray but in our understanding that they are wrong in so many things we have quickly dismissed all of their teaching and yet they were correct in offering many bible verses to teach that the lord will reign on the earth for a period of time. And, and they went to Psalm 2, Revelation 19, 15, and 16, where the Lord will rule with a rod of iron and, and he'll be king of kings and lord of lords. They went to Daniel 7, and we see now that these passages do teach that Christ is reigning on the earth. Now, they also go to Psalm 72, and I'll just read a few verses out of that psalm, and the premillennialists do. In Psalm 72, uh, beginning in verse 8, it says, He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents, the kings of Sheba and Seba, shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. And, and, and this is what we're finding um, repeatedly. This language, he will smite the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. And, uh, and this has been going on since May 21. And we're just now beginning to get more of a proper appreciation for that day and, and what God has wrought, what he has done in uh, bringing the victory to his kingdom, in conquering the enemy um, of the kingdom of darkness. And it was a grand and glorious day in which the Lord Jesus is exalted over the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of Satan was the nations of this world, the people 
that that were in darkness, the unsaved inhabitants of the earth. And so Revelation 2.27 says, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now, the word rule, let, let's, let's um, spend a little time looking at this word rule. It's found 11 times in the New Testament. And it, it's also found in the Old Testament, but we're, we're going to concentrate on the Greek word translated as rule. It's found 11 times and four times it's translated as rule. In this verse, in Revelation 2.27, in Revelation 12.5, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And in Revelation 19, in verse 15, which we've read, but I'll read it again. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Those are the three verses that, that have that statement in it, that Christ will rule with a rod of iron. Now, a fourth place that it's translated as rule is in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 2. And it says in verse 5 of Matthew 2, And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. And, of course, this is referring to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, as uh, in Matthew 2, we're, uh, we're reading uh, information concerning his birth. And, and uh, Herod had asked the priests and the scribes um, where Christ should be born, and they referred back to the book of Micah. This is a quote from Micah that he would be born in Bethlehem and he would come forth a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now, so far as we've seen this word used in these four places, it's very consistent. And certainly it, it would mean to rule. But it's the same word is found seven other times in the New Testament. And in these other places, it's translated differently. It's translated as feed or feeding. And for instance, in Luke 17, actually, we're going to look at each one of these places, each one of the verses, so we see exactly how this word is used. In Luke 17, verse 7, it says, But which of you, having a servant plowing, or feeding cattle. And the word feeding is the word translated as rule in, in Revelation 2.27. And in the verses we've looked at. We'll say unto him by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet. So that's one place. And then also in John 21. And this is a passage we're, we're getting more familiar with in these days after the tribulation. In John 21, when the Lord says three times to Simon Peter, he first asks him, do you love me? And then he tells him to feed his sheep. Well, in John 21, verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And the word feed is the word rule in our verse. He will rule them with a rod of iron. And we wonder, well, how can this be the same word? But it, it doesn't and there, let's go to Acts chapter 20, and we'll find this word used again in verse 28. Acts 20, 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock 
over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Now, once again, a flock is mentioned and then the word feed the uh, people of God, the church of God. And, and, and so that's three places of the seven. A fourth is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In verse 7, who goeth a warfare any time in his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? And again, a flock and feeding. And um, the fifth place is in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5. And verse 2, feed the flock of God. And Peter hasn't forgotten the lesson that the Lord taught him. Uh, as we read in John 21, if you love me, feed my sheep. And here he's moved to write under inspiration of God, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now, in, in these places we've been reading, it, it's not um, literal flock, but it is the spiritual flock. When Christ says, feed my sheep, he's talking about people. When Acts 20 said, feed the church of God, it's talking about people. And here in 1 Peter 5, feed the flock, it's talking about people. And the flock are the people of God and the feed or the food is the word of God. That's how we spiritually feed sheep by ministering, by serving, by sharing the truth of the Bible with them. That is feeding sheep. You know, at, in this day that we're living in, in the day of judgment, we, we really have to ask the question, how do we best feed sheep? Is it by going back to the very first principles of the gospel and, and, and teaching them um, the basics? No. Well, that, that's a part of it. Of course, we want to teach all, all the truth of the Bible. But we feed sheep by telling them what has happened. By letting them know May 21, 2011 was Judgment Day. By letting them know that the Great Tribulation has already come and, and ended. It has concluded. And by letting them know we're living in the days after the Tribulation. By letting them know that God's wrath is on the people of the world. By letting them know the door to heaven is shut. And the Lord is no longer saving any individual by letting them know that God is severely trying his people. By letting them know the truth of the scripture, we're feeding sheep. It's not just simply um, uh, singing a hymn and, and reading scripture without comment and, and going over the basics. Uh, these sheep were saved. How? This great multitude that God saved out of great tribulation. How were they saved? What means that God used primarily? Primarily, he used the message of Judgment Day, a proclamation that was sent out into the world in an unprecedented manner, that means never before in the history of the world had the nations of the world heard this message to the degree in such an intense way that they heard the message of Judgment Day coming on May 21, 2011. They could not avoid it. The secular media, the, the people who normally... Um, have no interest we're all talking about it and thinking about it and it, it just could not be 
dismissed. It could not be ignored. God put the message of the Bible, Judgment Day, that we're sinners, that he is the judge, that he will destroy us, and that also he's merciful and gracious, and and that uh, we were to go to him before the door to heaven shut on May 21. God put this message in the forefront of the eyes of mankind as he never had before, and he saved a great multitude by it or through it. And now uh, these people were drawn by that information. And now suddenly, uh, is it the correct thing to do? Is it the right thing to do to just cease mentioning that day? To no longer talk about a great tribulation? To no longer talk about the judgment of God upon the world? No, no, we, we have to follow up with them. We have to let them know, inform them. Well, you see, it wasn't an error at all. It was Judgment Day. Uh, your interest was genuine because Christ says, the Bible tells us, my sheep hear my voice. You are the sheep. You are the flock of God. You heard the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ when he warned you about this day. And he brought it to pass. We, we were uh, incorrect about how it would happen as far as its outworkings. We had thought it would be physical, but it was spiritual. And, and that's very real. It doesn't mean it didn't happen because it was spiritual. It just means we could not see it with our physical eyes. This is feeding sheep. We're telling them what happened and what God has done since and and what he expects of us. He expects us to glorify him in the fire that he has lit in the day of judgment. It would be speaking down to them and and really uh, it would be deceitful to not mention this day any longer and to avoid discussing it and just to to play music and and oh let's let's talk about the basics of Christianity like so many churches and and not get into the meat of the word when it was the meat of the word that God opened up at the time of the end as he unsealed the scriptures and it was the meat that drew these sheep to the shepherd and and then to just forget about the meat and now we're going to go back to the milk well that that is not the plan of god we are to continue looking at the things that god has graciously and kindly opened up to us in this time in this day of the end and in, in the day of judgment well again first corinthians 9 and first peter 5 verse 2 also speak of feeding and the word is found a sixth time as feed in jude jude 12 where it says these are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you feeding themselves without fear and and this is a reference to false prophets it really identifies with what the lord spoke about in the book of ezekiel concerning shepherds that ought to have been feeding the flock it says in ezekiel 34 and, and yet instead of feeding the flock, they feed themselves of the flock. It, in Ezekiel 34, um, 2, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves, shall not the shepherds feed the flocks. So again, in an indirect way, this word in Jude 12 is also referring to feeding flocks or what what those individuals involved with the gospel should have been doing with the word of god and we're not doing 
but were feeding themselves. And the last place is in Revelation chapter 7 and this wonderful chapter where God speaks of um, his salvation plan during the church age, saving uh, 144,000, uh, which point to the first fruits, all those that would be saved throughout the 1955 years of the church age. And then after this, it's said in Revelation 7, 9, I beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And, and God has the question asked, where did they come from? And verse 14 answers, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Now now let's listen to verse 17 especially. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is what the Lord Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, is going to do to the great multitude that comes out of great tribulation. He is going to feed them. And, and that's the same word as rule in Revelation 2.27 or Revelation 19.15 and so on. This is the plan of God. The Lord Jesus will feed his sheep. And of course, he does this through his people as he demonstrated when he fed the multitude with just a few loaves of bread. He takes the bread and breaks it. And he gives the bread to his disciples and the disciples he gives to the multitude. That's the, the way, the method that Christ uses to feed sheep. He, he doesn't speak to us. He doesn't break the barrier of the supernatural. But he teaches us to use the Bible to compare spiritual with spiritual and, and to come to truthful conclusions and and then to make sure carefully those conclusions harmonize with the whole bible and then we may teach and yet the bible says the holy ghost teaches and that is how christ feeds sheep and this is the plan of god for these days after the tribulation for the time in which the Lord is ruling the nations. You know, we could read that. He is feeding the nations with a rod of iron. And that just just uh, makes us shake our head. We don't understand that. Well, when we get together in our next Bible study, we'll, we'll think about that. Feeding the nations with a rod of iron. 